So, uh, on behalf of the Schiller Institute in Denmark and also on the Copenhagen Bureau of the Executive Intelligence Review, I want to in greet everybody and tell you we are happy to see you here. This is our first physical event in a long, long time. And we decided, because of the urgency of the matter at hand, the situation in Afghanistan, that we would very quickly pull together this seminar because we had the opportunity to get some very prominent guests to speak for us. Because as we see it, uh, first of all, we have an extremely urgent situation in Afghanistan. We have a humanitarian catastrophe beyond belief that is developing right now if the world is not working together to deal with it. But at the same time, it is also a very pregnant moment in, 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 in human history because the first the pullout of the US troops from Afghanistan and the total collapse of uh, the US or Western backed and trained forces there within a very short period basically collapse the whole fairy tale or the whole what, what they call the narrative of what has been going on in Afghanistan over the last 20 years of rebuilding democracy and all of these imaginative ideas, but also is an expression of the same process going on in, in general in huge large parts of Southwest Asia. And when all of this came to be, uh, the president of the Schiller Institute, Helga Sepler Rouge, basically came out and says, this is not, people come out and say this is like the Saigon moment, this is like the US pulling out of Vietnam, but that's not the right parallel. This is like the collapse of the Berlin Wall. This is the end of an era. And with the end of an era, the question immediately comes, well, what then will be the new era to come? What will be uh, in it? And what we have been doing in the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche forces for many, many decades, for half a century, is to answer the question once one system, one paradigm collapses, to already in advance define what should then follow next. And our answer has been to, to say, well, instead of thinking what should be the next phase of chaos and war to follow, in Afghanistan or in Southwest Asia, in the world in general. The question should be, how do we right now build peace through development? How do we out of this, these very, very tragic circumstances uh, use the opportunity to replace the old paradigm with geopolitical considerations, with the question of how can we uh, how can we annoy the others? A little bit like we, the moment you had with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 when Europe had been at war for a hundred years with all kind of religious war and political wars and this and that, just one war following the other. When the governments of Europe realized that if we continue this there will be nobody left to report about it. So therefore we have to sit together and find out a way to live together where we respect each other's countries or religions and whatever you have. And instead of thinking about how can we sabotage what the others are doing, then we instead we want to have the principle of how can we help our neighbors. And as we, this choice has not been made. I mean, in Denmark right now, Denmark being a very, since 1999, having gone from having participating in peacekeeping operations, Denmark made a switch and instead went into a militaristic foreign policy, basically joining every single war around, despite being only 5.8 million people. Now in Denmark, there's a reflection saying, this was an auto failure, what now? And we want to make sure that this what now comes on a totally new level in terms of what should uh, be part of this. So, uh, uh, of course we should not continue with what did not work. 
We now know that you cannot solve problems through military means. But we also now have to, in the different nations, Denmark most emphatically included, have to have this idea, well, if we are to solve these things, this is going to be through collaboration. And it's going to be through collaboration with all the neighbors, all the participants, of course the United States, but also of course China, of course Russia, and so on. So that being said, I will uh, present our speakers that we are very proud to have here today. Uh, we have first Hussein Askari, who is the Schiller Institute Southwest Asia coordinator. He is the author of The Dawn of Geoeconomics, Extending the Belt and Road to Afghanistan, and has been co-authoring a lot of these very, very uh, beautiful reports we've been making about how to, developing, to develop the new Silk Road. Uh, then we have a guest coming in here from, from Italy, uh, Professor Pino Alacchi, who has also a very elaborate and long uh, CV, uh, but in this capacity, in his long career, has been the executive director of the United Nations Office for Drug Control and Crime Prevention from 1997 to 2002, and in that function negotiated an almost total el el elimination of opium production within in Afghanistan with the Taliban before 2001, and I think you're going to also tell us something about that. And also a former EU rapporteur on Afghanistan and now a professor of socio sociology at the School of Political Science at the University of Sassari in Italy. So he will speak next, and then we'll have also a speech by His Excellency Ahmad uh, Farouk, Ambassador of Pakistan to the Kingdom of Denmark since 2020, who has also, I think, for a long time been involved, especially uh, for Pakistan in the United Nations and in also dealing with the issues of counter-terrorism, peace and security. So the idea is basically that we'll have let the speakers give presentations which we will stream and then we'll shut off the live stream. We'll still do recordings or later with the permissions of, the, of those involved. Uh, if something important that we afterwards can put out, then we will put out, but we'll put out nothing without having proper authorization from those saying what they said. So people... Put out the answers. We'll put out the answers, but again, uh, uh, we do it like that because we do appreciate a free and frank discussions. People should speak their mind and not, like it's very common, just say what they think other people would like uh, to hear them saying. So uh, with that, I think Hussein, I'll pass the microphone to you, very physically here. And we'll have plenty of time for, for discussion after the presentation. So write down your, your questions, make sure you have them up, keep them. Okay, there's some technical issues here. Can I just use this for one minute? Okay. Can I have the whole thing? This is for the for the Zoom people, uh, we will be cutting off the Zoom before the discussion. So if you have questions, uh, please write them in the chat during the presentations, and then I will uh, try to ask them. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tom. It's a great pleasure to be here back in, in uh, Copenhagen. Your Excellency Ambassador Ahmed Farouk and uh, Professor Pino Alaki, it's a great honor for me to share this panel with you. Uh, as uh, Tom said, just a general outline for our discussion is that we are not here to analyze things. We are here to start a, a, a process, a development process, which Mrs. Helga Tseptarush, the chairwoman of our Schiller Institute, launched already in July, even before Taliban took over, because she realized that this, the end of the game has come and that there is a new paradigm that should replace the old uh, failed paradigm, as everybody could see uh, for themselves. Now, I will be focusing on three uh, parts in my presentation. 
the first one is the, on the um, humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, the second one will be on the, uh, on the failure of geopolitics. <coughs> And uh, then we go more in detail into what we think uh, is the solution, the way to go forward concerning not only Afghanistan, but whole Eurasia and world politics. So there is a very s cynical... The map is on your face. Can you uh, okay. To the left or the right? Yeah. Okay, we can turn it on. At the moment. Uh, the, uh, there's a very cynical game being played by the same forces who had occupied Afghanistan for 20 years and then they left the country completely in ruins. Now they say, look, by after cutting all the financial aid to Afghanistan, the United States have frozen $9 billion of the money of the government of Afghanistan. It's not the money of Taliban. It is for the government and state of Afghanistan to be able to import food, electricity, medicine and all things. Now they say, look, Taliban are incapable of governing because there is famine, there is chaos, hospitals are closed, there is no electricity, there is no food, there is no medicine. Look, the Taliban cannot govern. And that's a very, very cynical attitude which we have to reverse very quickly because what is at stake is not the Taliban, what is at stake 39 million people in Afghanistan who very few people talk about. Now, some people try to blame everything on the Taliban to cover for their own failure, because why a country after 20 years and $2.5 trillion spent cannot grow its own food, cannot have hospitals, cannot produce its own electricity, and there is shortage of water, there is shortage of everything. So to cover for their failure, those forces are saying, look, the Taliban is a failed state, Afghanistan is a failed state, but I hope this will not happen, as I will explain. Now, as it recently international aid organizations, but especially the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Program have said that there are 14 million people in Afghanistan immediately threatened by famine. Uh, that they are hungry already, but 4 million are threatened by famine. That those people can perish, they can die if there isn't enough food uh, uh, sent to them. We have tens of maybe hundreds of small clinics were closed because international organizations were pulled out, abandoned their, their, um, their work there. These, these centers are closed, although they are very small, but they are, uh, presented some, uh, some, um, some services to the population. We have now even the food and agriculture organizations saying that probably we have missed the farmers in Afghanistan this, at the end of September, probably they missed to saw the seeds for the winter wheat harvest, the winter wheat production. So this is an additional because the farmers need the seeds to get, come from outside the country to plant the seeds. Now many hospitals will not be able to provide uh, services because guess what? Afghanistan imports 80% of all electricity from neighboring countries. Now with the freezing of the assets of the government, they cannot pay the bills of electricity to Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Iran, and they cannot pay for the food which was coming from Pakistan, which was the biggest exporter of food to Afghanistan. Uh, so the whole country is in a total disaster and this has to be prevented immediately. So we should remove the cynicism, the cynical view that let them let there be chaos so we can prove to everyone that Taliban have failed, Taliban's neighbors have failed, but I don't think this is going to happen uh, this way. But I think for the United States, for the NATO countries, and for the EU, there is a way back from that failure by contributing to remedying this disaster, allowing the aid to go back, unfreeze the money which the Afghanistan government can use, and collaborate with Afghanistan's uh, neighbors with China, with Russia, with Pakistan, Iran, all these neighbors to rebuild Afghanistan's economy, as I will explain. So now we, that's an immediate priority for both us, the Schiller Institute, but it should be a priority for everyone to mobilize to stop that. Now the other uh, aspect of this is the failure of geopolitics. Um, I will try to stay away from the screen. So. 
Anyway, the, what, what Tom said, Mrs. Helge Sefflarouche said, this is not Saigon 1975, this is the Berlin Wall uh, 1989, because we had an era which has ended. And hopefully, the era of geopolitics, which extended for 200 years, probably is ending in the same place where it was born. The great game was born in Afghanistan when the British Empire and this is a very valuable book, it's called The Great Game. This is one of the first books I was given in the Schiller Institute in the 1996 when I joined. And it details how the British Empire played Afghanistan as a buffer against, the so against Russia. And all Afghanistan's border were created by British officers, intelligence officers, who made agreements with tribal chiefs uh, in different parts of, especially in this area around the Panjshir uh, River. All these were creations of the British to make, because they could not control Afghanistan. The British lost three wars in Afghanistan in 1839-42, in the 1870s, and in 1919. They invaded Afghanistan, but they could not keep it. So they turned Afghanistan into a buffer. And if you look at the topography of Afghanistan, it is a natural barrier between the North and the South. So the British used that. And the very person, the British intelligence officer who coined the term uh, the great game, Arthur Connolly, uh, he was beheaded in Bukhara in Uzbekistan because he was disguised as a Muslim merchant and he was caught spying there. And he ended up being beheaded by the, the governor, the emir of Bukhara. But my point is that in the same place where geopolitics, the destructive geopolitics uh, or the great game started, can end now. And that failure we saw not only in the whole Soviet era, the mobilization of the so-called Mujahideen against the Soviet army in the 80s, uh, which had also catastrophic results, but then we had a civil war as a result of that in the whole 90s, the Taliban come in. Uh, and then now we have had, since 2001, a catastrophic new page in that history of geopolitics, which we hope, we believe it can end now. So I usually don't like to talk about numbers of victims, and, uh, but it gives an idea about the enormous suffering which was created since 2001 both in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq and other countries who were uh, regime changed, uh, in a sense. So we have these numbers, this is a project in the Brown University in the United States uh, called The Cost of War. I have written an article about what these wars have caused, and it's a massive suffering of the civilian population in Afghanistan. Now, some people told me these are conservative numbers, but these are what are documented. Uh, we had 270,000 civilians killed, both Afghanistan and Pakistan, because Pakistan also suffered from this war. Uh, we had 73 Afghan soldiers killed. We had 2,298 and 3,904 American so-called contractors. These are mercenaries uh, also killed. But then look at the massive, <laughs> the 30,000 American soldiers or veterans committed suicide after going home. Now, you can also imagine the enormous suffering of their families, of the community where they live. Uh, we, they were, there are 2.5, according to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, it says that there are 2.5 million refugees in, from Afghanistan in neighboring country, mostly in Pakistan and in in Iran. Uh, I think this is also a conservative number. Uh, there is also uh, 3.5 million people internally displaced because of the civil war, all the other conflicts they had to move, especially people moved to the big cities, creating even more misery. And then we had the financial cost of the war in Afghanistan, $2.2 trillion. And this is an enormous amount of money. And there was nothing built in Afghanistan all these 20 years. All this money was used on fighting, on weapons, on soldiers and also on corruption, fostering corruption in the community. But totally since 2001, all the wars the United States was involved in cost $10 trillion. And this is an incredible, I tried to quantify it in my head, 
what you can do with 10 trillion dollars, you can build 17 times China's high-speed railway network, 30,000 kilometers. You can build 17 such networks with the 10 trillion dollars. You can build 322 Three Gorges dams in the world, producing 6,400,000 megawatts of power. This is what the world needs, actually. 6,400,000 uh, uh, megawatts uh, of electricity. This is what you need to cover every person on the planet, that they will have electricity in their home. This is what that war, these wars have cost. But none of, none of this was, was, uh, was used. So I, I wrote an article about the cost of war and the cost of construction. I compared all these, the disasters the United States have been involved in and NATO to the China's Belt and Road Initiative. With only less than one trillion dollars, China built thousands of kilometers of railways, power plants, uh, ports, airports, agricultural projects, industrial zones, and so on and so forth, with less, with less than 10% of what was spent on these wars. So in this sense, we have uh, come to this. This is my third, the third section of my presentation, which is, as Biden said, this is the end of an era. So what is coming after that era? And Mrs. Helga Septarush <coughs> said, it's the era of peace through economic development. And the best model we have is the Belt and Road Initiative because that thing works. It has proven it works. China's own massive economic and industrial development is a proof of the method of how to finance and build infrastructure, pull, pull people out of poverty. China pulled 800 million people out of poverty in the last 30 years. So in any case, but this idea of connecting the whole world, not creating two camps, one is China, Russia, and one is the West. This has been the concept of our Schiller Institute uh, since the 1990s. So we are not analyzing things, we are campaigning. We are lobbying to change the world policy. And therefore, all these years, as, as uh, we have produced all this material, we have been in dialogue with governments, we have been in dialogue with think tanks, with engineers, with companies, and so on and so forth, to make sure that people both understand the importance of connecting nations, regions, and continents for their own economic prosperity, but also as a means to establish peace among nations. Now, Afghanistan, now the green lines are the Belt and Road Initiative lines, the different corridors are proposed by China. But the rest, including the Belt and Road, is our ideas, how to connect the continents and include every country in that development. Now, in the past 20 years, now people ask me, how can you know that the Taliban have changed? I said, I have no idea if Taliban have changed. I'm not a Taliban expert. What I know is that the world around Afghanistan has changed. That's what I know, and that's what I've been working with, because with if you look at the region around Afghanistan, especially the China-Pakistan economic corridor, is creating an economic revolution in the country, although people are in a hurry to harvest the benefits and say, oh, okay, where is it? That's a massive development program between China and Pakistan, just south to the border of Afghanistan. To the north of the border, you had the, the, the new Silk Road, the Iron Silk Road, but also there has been a very big shift in the Central Asian countries to work with Russia and China, but mostly with China, uh, and become the bridge between East and West because many nations in Central Asia and the Caucasus were told, if you don't work with Russia, if you don't work with China, if you don't work with Iran, we will help you get your oil and gas somehow, somewhere to the West. It didn't happen. There's a physical, geographical reality you cannot jump over that reality. And therefore now, Central Asia is oriented towards uh, Asia. Even Iran has, is oriented towards China with this strategic agreement they signed last year. But the new president of Iran has also indicated very clearly that going east is the, 
the product. But all these years, all these things happening, Afghanistan is not touched by it. There no development inside Afghanistan under NATO US control. So the country was almost sealed away from its environment, natural environment. Uh, and what happened is like exactly also what happened in Iraq. You had the failure of Western politicians, not only in grasping strategic issues, but understanding economy. So they told the Afghans, okay, you need electricity, here is some money, you can buy electricity from Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and uh, Iran. Oh, you need food, here is some money, you can buy food from Pakistan. You need medicine, here is some money, you can buy medicine from China. So th they think they can solve everything with money. So now what happens when the money is not there? So why not get the Afghanis to build power plants in their country so they can produce their own electricity? There is a lot of hydropower potential, there is coal, and so on and so forth. Why not? Let the, build some power plants in Afghanistan using a little tiny bit of the war budget. Why not allow the Afghanis to grow food instead of opium? I'm not going to discuss the opium question because Professor Alaki is going to discuss it. So all these years, Afghanistan, it was, while things are happening around it, Afghanistan was left behind in this process. So. Another thing which has happened, which very few people in the West have grasped, is that this orientation to the East, but it's not really just an orientation to the East. Now, last, last month there was the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. Now, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization were preparing for the US and NATO withdrawal long time. They were prepared to step in in case uh, the United States and NATO completely abandoned Afghanistan. But the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was initially a security cooperation organization, have now become a security but also economic cooperation organization. And now, last month, Iran was admitted in, as a full member. The countries in dark green are the uh, full members, the light green are observers, but last month Iran was admitted as a full member in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So you have a physical block, a geographical block from China, including Russia, including India, Pakistan, Iran, Central Asia, all the way to the borders with Turkey, a NATO member, but the Turks are getting more and more frustrated by the US and the West, and they are moving slowly to reorient towards Russia or China. Uh, you have even in the Caucasus. So you have a huge uninterrupted block of nations where you don't have British intelligence spies or American troops in between them. This is very, very important. Those nations now can work freely to establish a stronger economic unity, but also use that to secure the situation. Now people say, well, first you have to have security, then you can build the economy. Wrong. You have to build the economy to be able to stabilize the security situation. In Pakistan, you had many attacks on the Chinese companies and Pakistani engineers who, were who are building the infrastructure and the CPEC projects. But the prime minister decided to go ahead. You cannot stop building the economy because if you stop it, then the terrorists will win. You prove that it works. But what the Pakistanis are doing are saying terrorism will not stop us, will not terror, but we will not wait until the situation is stable because economic backwardness is a big source of instability and, and terrorism. And it can be used by intelligence forces to finance extremist separatist groups, and so on and for, so forth. So then we come to our vision of how this new paradigm, what to do with Afghanistan. Now, there are many internal Afghani things. We are not interested in micromanaging the Afghani society as the EU or the United States were doing, telling people how to dress, what to eat, how to treat their children. 
you cannot do this to another nation. What you can do from the outside is you offer them, you make an offer they cannot say no to. By saying, we will help you integrate your economy into this Belt and Road process. We can build infrastructure. We can help you immediately with the humanitarian problem. But if you respect us as neighbors, if you work with us on security matters, we can also help build your infrastructure. It's important for you, but it's important for us. So everybody wins. This is the win-win concept. So in that sense, we try to take ideas from different sources, including from the Afghan former uh, foreign ministry. Uh, and also one important thing about our work is we don't play geopolitics because there are many infrastructure projects proposed by the United States, for example, the so-called TAPI pipeline, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. The idea, and we said at the time, this will never be built because it's a geopolitical uh, intention behind it. It's not to help people. The idea was to make sure that Turkmenistan, which has a huge gas reserve, does not work with Russia or China. So it can take the gas directly through Afghanistan and Pakistan to India, our allies, and to the international markets. And they wanted to prevent that in Iran and Pakistan and India build the peace pipeline to export gas from Iran to Pakistan and India. That was stopped too. So, but reality asserted itself and now Turkmenistan is exporting almost all its gas to China. And the Kazakhstan and other nations are dependent on Russia to export there. So there is this geographical right. In our idea that all these projects should be integrated together, not to play geopolitics, but to integrate the economies of these regions. So this is one of the ideas which with the former uh, foreign ministry, the RICA, the Regional Economic uh, Cooperation, uh, uh, <coughs> I don't remember the, anyway, the, Afghanistan joined the Belt and Road in 2016. So the Abdullah Abdullah went to China, signed the agreement, uh, but then nothing was done. Uh, Afghanistan also became a member of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to get loans for infrastructure, but that didn't lead anywhere for obvious reasons. Uh, opposition from the West, but also the corruption inside the country. But they had very brilliant ideas for connecting the major cities of Afghanistan, but also connecting Afghanistan to its neighbors. But what you see missing in their maps is the connection to Pakistan and, and China. They didn't want to have that included because the Afghan government had problems with Pakistan. So now we want to remove these kinds of differences. And there is no reason why not the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline should be built. It will benefit everybody. It will ease the tension between these nations uh, and make sure that India is working with China, with Pakistan, with its environment, rather than playing a, a bad geopolitical role uh, in these. Uh, so th the ideas are there, the plans are there. Many s agreements were signed, but they were never implemented. So that should become a priority for discussion now, not later, how the Shanghai Cooperation Organization inviting Europe and the United States to say, look, we want you here, but we want to talk about this. We don't want to talk about war against terrorism. We don't want to talk about fundamentalism or changing the culture or changing the regime. We want you to see, can you contribute to this? Can you help finance and build projects? So there should be a dialogue, a global dialogue for all these uh, all these, I mean, there are also old Russian plans. We have it in our first report. Uh, a Russian academy had designed plans for connecting Afghanistan to, to Central Asia and Northern Siberia. We have enormous potential in, in Afghanistan, most importantly, the human potential, the human resources. You have 39 million people, but more than 60% are below the age of 30. People who are below, above, 62 years in Afghanistan are only 2% of the population. Uh, also because the, the, the longevity 
uh, have gone down because of all these words. But you have a huge young population. If they are provided with education, with the resources, uh, the infrastructure, then they can become the most important wealth of the country. Everybody have heard about all the great minerals that are in Afghanistan, worth $1 trillion. You have the copper mines, you have uh, iron mines, but also lithium and rare air metals all over Afghanistan, uh, which is true. But it is not to focus on the money, because everybody's talking about $1 trillion, $1 trillion. These can actually be used as an asset to establish a bank, a national bank of development, using their natural resources as a, as a guarantee for issuing credit for development. But that's another discussion. The United States Geological Survey did a fantastic job. This is one of the few things they did well, is they surveyed the whole surface of Afghanistan, using, including remote sensing, satellite imaging. They had sent a geologist. And they covered every part of Afghanistan to find out the minerals, the non-oil and gas minerals in the country. And uh, this is a report, <laughs> interestingly, uh, after the United States withdrew from Afghanistan, the site disappeared, which has all the studies. You, can, you click on it, it doesn't open up, but this is the name of the study. If somebody has saved it as PDF, but it was a huge database, and that database is not available now since the United States withdrew. And these are also all the regions of Afghanistan which were studied. Uh, this is a, the Mess Ainak major copper mine. I will come back to it because there are certain things which we have learned from Lyndon LaRouche about physical economics which have nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with these things. There is a physical reality people have to pay attention to. For example, one of the th reasons the, the Chinese company which took the contract for the copper mine did not fulfill the contract is because if you want to extract any mineral, especially lithium, but also copper and iron, you need huge amounts of fresh water. You cannot take the iron from the ground and sell it in the market. It's mixed with the other things. You have to crush it, you have to wash it, and separate the iron or copper or lithium from the, that takes huge amounts of water. <coughs> and Afghanistan is a dry country. It takes a lot of electricity and power. You need transport. So Afghanistan does have uh, rivers. The problem is that most of them, they depend on uh, snow melting in the mountains, but also they are transboundary rivers. So they share it with other countries. And Afghanistan has only one agreement with Iran on transboundary rivers. They have no agreements with other countries. So nobody knows who can control the water. But also, Afghanistan receives 55 billion cubic meters of water every year through precipitation and other means. It's as much as Egypt gets in the Nile every year. But that water is spread all over the place. It's not used. So in, to do that, you need to build dams. You need to build management systems, you, you, all kinds of modern infrastructure to save the water and to use it in the right way. So this is one of the big problems that have to be solved. And that will help also to utilize the minerals in the country. Without water, you cannot do it. Now, this is a, also interesting, showing the, the big disaster which was left in Afghanistan. Afghanistan produces, as I said, only 600 megawatts. That's a small power plant here in Denmark. The rest they import from other countries, mostly from Uzbekistan. But Iran, which is under harsh economic sanctions, not only produces electricity for its own people, it exports part of it to Afghanistan and exports part of it to Iraq, who have been under US and uh, Western control all these years. It's a big irony. So, all these years, nobody thought about why not build some power plants in Afghanistan. In Pakistan, in the last five, six years, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor projects produced and planned 17,000 megawatts of power. Hydropower, coal power, and including two nuclear reactors being built in Karachi. And everybody's attacking China, but nobody's saying anything about this disaster we have in Afghanistan. So anyway, these, uh, 
the geopolitics of pipelines, you know, I make jokes about it because they never happen. But if we have a new paradigm of relations, I just wanted to show this, which is the irony to understand that geopolitics don't work, geoeconomics work. The reality today is that Central Asia's major uh, gas and oil market is China. It's not Denmark, it's not Brussels, it's not Washington. There is a physical, geographical reality which governs the new situation here. And all nations around Afghanistan, I think they have realized this, but the important thing now is to, uh, is to avoid that Afghanistan descends into chaos because what you will have if the, the current government collapses, if you have famine, you will have, of course, refugees everywhere, but then you'll have terrorist groups taking over the country. It will spill over over the neighbors, and it might have international implications. I think, therefore, I, I'm very sure that the neighboring countries, and there are already humanitarian aid going from China, Pakistan, Iran. I was in Iran recently. There are regular flights from Tehran to Kabul. That's, uh, so there is a certain normalization process going on. And all the countries now realize around Afghanistan, and I think they have plans to, um, to help normalize the situation in Afghanistan, no matter who is in government. But also, our job is to make sure that Europe and the United States, instead of cynically sitting here, hoping to see the Taliban collapse and the country go into chaos to prove the fact that the Taliban are not better than us, they should join. There is a room for atonement. There is a room for changing your, your way of doing things and join the new paradigm by opening a dialogue with the neighbors of Afghanistan, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and see what kind of projects the United States and Europe can contribute to. The United States under President Franklin Roosevelt in World War II already had many plans for development of Afghanistan development of African nations, even China. There was a different mindset governing the policies in the United States, and people can go back to that, and Europe can go back to its humanist tradition and contribute to something to not pay for all the sins, but to create a new situation whereby these old mistakes are not repeated. So this is what I have to say so far, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much to the Schiller, Schiller Institute for the invitation that they accepted with enthusiasm and with you to stay with me talking about a subject that I'm dealing with since a couple of decades, uh, three decades now, Afghanistan that um, I dealt in uh, a couple of roles. First, as uh, Afghanistan, as the main producer of narcotic crops in the world, producer of uh, most of opium and heroin that is consumed in Western Europe. And my role at that time was uh, the executive director of UNODC. And then, uh, as a member of the European Parliament, I dealt again with Afghanistan as the author of the uh, strategy for Afghanistan for the European Union. It is a report that has been approved largely by the European Parliament in 2010 and then ignored by the European Commission in the years, subsequent years. So Afghanistan is in my heart uh, not only as a student of uh, political affairs and a sociologist, but uh, as a country that is uh, plenty of uh, meaning and symbols for all of us in Europe and in the rest of the world. And uh, last summer we had an evidence about it, in which the issue of Afghanistan seemed to uh, become number one priority in the world. Just uh, to see, two months later, 
a complete collapse of interest about Afghanistan and all that is related to, to it. I'm struck these days about this uh, uh, radical shift of the interest in the international public opinion, both in the media and uh, in politics, about Afghanistan. Once uh, the last uh, American soldiers left the country, and after almost all Western uh, people evacuated the country, suddenly a curtain of silence went on Afghanistan. So no one, in the last two weeks I, I read the Italian newspaper, there was just one article about Afghanistan. No one now seems to be particularly interested on the subject. And uh, this is, uh, uh, unfortunately, a confirmation of an attitude that we in the West have on uh, whatever does not fit into our vision of the world. As we say, said before, we have a completely new paradigm in uh, the world order and in political affairs that is now showing more and more clearly in one day after another. But this paradigm did not start with Afghanistan crisis. It started several decades ago. And uh, what is happening now is just uh, that we are being aware of uh, this new configuration of the world. But let's go by first <laughs> face by face. My interest in Afghanistan was about drug control. And uh, when I got uh, my job at the top of the UN, I thought that was the opportunity to put into practice what, as a student, I had uh, elaborated several years before. The fact that uh, the problem of uh, heavy drugs, both heroin and cocaine, consumed in the West, as uh, there is origin in the country that produces the drugs. Not only by physical, obviously, these are natural drugs that are produced elsewhere, not in Europe, but also from economic and, uh, and uh, the social point of view. So the best strategy was not to attack the problem here in the final stage of the drug trail. The best way was to go at the source. For one main economic reason, the fact that at the source the opium problem is very small in terms of economical terms. Opium issue, heroin issue, drug addiction becomes a big problem at the end of the chain. What I was always struck by the figures about the heroin production in Afghanistan. One kilo of opium poppy is transformed, 10 kilos of opium poppy are the equivalent of one kilo of heroin. One kilo of opium poppy in Afghanistan does not cost more than 10, 20 dollars. So the price of one kilo of heroin in Afghanistan at the farm gate does not go more than 200. 100, 200, 300 dollars. One kilo of heroin here in Copenhagen costs around 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 dollars. So strategically, it was much more reasonable to intervene at the source. The farm gate production of opium pop in Afghanistan when I started to deal with the country was around 100 million dollars a year. Last year, 2020, was 350 million dollars. All the production of opium poppy in Afghanistan. It means 90 percent of the world heroin. So 350 million dollars becomes 15 billion 
dollar here in Europe and almost the equivalent in the United States. So I was not the first to think that uh, we could drastically intervene with a very small amount of resources at the source, simply eliminating the production of opium poppy, providing Afghan farmers a viable alternative in terms of crop substitution, or we elaborate the concept, we did not uh, speak anymore about simple crop substitution, integral economic development. I developed a plan to eliminate opium poppy in Afghanistan in 10 years. This was in the year 1997. The plan was very simple. It costed $100 million, $20 million a year for five years to eliminate the production, 20% a year, and then another five years to consolidate the result. I presented this plan in Vienna to all member states and uh, I got a substantial uh, approval. I remember very well, particularly Denmark uh, and Sweden. They were the only country that pledged immediately around 10% of uh, all the figure, trusting just the plan that we presented them. But uh, I got a substantial OK by all member states, even by the Americans who were at the time in very good terms with the Taliban. The Taliban in that year basically had the control of 80% of the country. They were the government of Afghanistan. And uh, even, the, even particularly the United States told me, green light, go there. This is a country that we are not particularly interested in anymore, so you can work there. Uh, we will support uh, you, the program, and, and, and everything, even if uh, they never believed into crop substitution. The only country that believed in crop substitutions were uh, Northern European countries, Scandinavian countries, uh, Italy, and Germany. They were supportive of the, of the idea. Many other countries never supported that, either because they didn't have any idea about it, or because the Americans always supported the idea of destroying the cultivation by burning the crops. And uh, they were always very skeptical about any alternative project. So I, at that time, the Clinton administration convinced the Americans that they should at least look the results of this program and then see. So they did not oppose it. We are talking about the unipolar moment of the world. At that time, the United, the United States were really the only superpower on the stage. So we could never do nothing in the UN without their OK. Um, I went to Afghanistan, where the UN had a quite huge intervention not only humanitarian programs, but also my program, which was a middle-sized program in the family of the UN programs, had a sizable amount of people. Particularly, we had uh, a couple of hundred people doing the serving opium pop in Afghanistan. Uh, we did every year a, a, a terrestrial uh, analysis province by province, area by area, of all uh, opium production. The other source were the USA government, particularly CIA, who at that time was the only owner of the satellites who did the aerial uh, survey of opium poppy production. Then at a certain point we clashed drastically on the results because our people on the ground we are um, mostly agronomists. We, I recruited the, basically all the agronomists in, uh, with the agronomical degree in Afghanistan. All local people with the other people that were, were around for a couple of months in Afghanistan at the time of the crop to determine with very 
substantial detail in the production. And then they, you were this satellite by CIA who were very frequently wrong because they could not detect uh, many areas in which uh, opium poppy was cultivated into, into hills or into not plain areas. In this case, satellites can make huge mistakes. Or when opium poppy was cultivated with other, close to other crops and so on. That was a big mistake. And also there was a, a, a sample survey. They did not survey all Afghanistan. They surveyed some areas and then deducted the result with a very ample margin of interpretation. That was subject to uh, a lot of discussion with us. Uh, since uh, at the end of the story they were the dominant power, before me, I mean, uh, there was a delegation of the CIA coming into Vienna with our experts, we discussed the result at the end of the story. There was a kind of agreement on the middle ground on figures about what was the production of opium poppy and also of coca production in uh, Latin America, in Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia, the same story. Uh, I stopped this uh, good uh, cooperation. Uh, we say, I said to them that, that the, 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 the part is over. Our survey is the survey that must be taken into account because it comes from independent source, which is the United Nations. The survey is funded by several countries. Included, included the United States, and uh, and and uh, satellites are not are not reliable, and sometimes they suddenly changed the result. For Colombia, for instance, uh, suddenly the result by satellite funded by uh, the CIA, and the result by the survey ground survey in Colombia done by us and funded by the State Department, the same <laughs> American government funding and so on, diverged completely to the point that Colombia was uh, put in the blacklist. Of course, CIA prevailed. So the, the, Colombia was put in a blacklist of countries against our opinion, the opinion of the State Department and the opinion of uh, uh, all the other countries who funded the, su the subject that uh, uh, detected a decrease in uh, coca production in Colombia that would not put uh, Colombia in the blacklist. But, parenthesis. Then I went to Afghanistan with this blessing on my, on my head. And I met the Taliban uh, leaders of the time. The Taliban at the time uh, had the prime minister that came to the meeting and uh, he told me uh, at the beginning of the meeting, you want to eliminate uh, uh, opium poppy production in Afghanistan in 10 years. With the two, was 250 the, the, fee, the correct figure. Why you want to wait uh, 10 years? You give me, us, 250 and we will do it in one year. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, I interrupted the negotiation and then uh, the, to consult with my people because I mean it was a huge thing. And then uh, I said to, to him, no, it's not feasible. First, I don't have 250 million and I have to ask donors to do it. Donors will never give me one dollar because of your reputation on the issue of women and on the issue of narcotics. You have no whatsoever credibility in the international community. So first, first you go ahead, show that you are credible, and then I can tell you that I will do whatever is in the power of the United Nations to support you on the issue of find alternatives for the peasants. Because of course you don't want to, to go with the using force or violence against the peasants and so on. They told me, yes, uh, yes, uh, the, they did not like the answer, they would prefer to say that. Uh, but first I told them, you have to prohibit opium cultivation, because you never did it. 
because they were playing with the Koran interpretation about intoxicants. The Koran, according to them, was not clear if uh, intoxicants, which is alcohol and so on, uh, uh, opium was in green time. So we uh, involved some um, uh, big uh, religious experts on their side, the Sunni experts about Koran, who concluded, we funded also the, the study of these experts, and uh, the conclusion was that opium was an intoxicant. And they did the prohibition of opium poppy. We, we wrote physically the, the law, and, and, and then they started to really uh, say that they were going to enforce it. Then we decided that the same meeting with the, the Prime Minister left and the, the governor of Kandahar stayed negotiating with me a kind of experiment in the Kandahar area. Uh, they would eliminate opium poppy in the Kandahar area and we would rehabilitate a whole factory who was there inactive, who were giving uh, jobs to more than 2,000 people, women included. It was built by the German cooperation decades ago and it was abandoned. Abandoned but in a very good condition. It means that giving just electricity <coughs> to this uh, factory, uh, we did an, a, an experiment and uh, the factory was working. So, uh, our proposal was elimination of uh, opium poppy in Kandahar area and rehabilitation of the factory and jobs to the people, women included. At this point, uh, there was a negotiation inside the Taliban. Uh, because uh, uh, initially they say no. Then I said, okay, <laughs> goodbye. No, goodbye. Now you have, I make a statement, and I will say that you refused to rehabilitate the factory, so to give more than 1,000 jobs to your people, uh, because of the issue of women that would not uh, work in the factory. At this point, he, the governor, consulted the supreme leader of the Taliban, Mullah Omar, who was living just a few kilometers away. Uh, and uh, at the end of the story, they said, yes, women can work in the factory, but in a separate area of the factory. They said, okay, no problem. But they will work in the factory, like all the others. They started to implement the, the agreement. At a certain point, the, the agreement uh, stopped because the factory was, uh, they told us that uh, we started to work on the factory. They said, no, 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 you stop the factory because we sold the factory to an investor, a foreign investor, who will take care of, of the factory instead of, instead of you. I said, yeah, okay, but then I discovered that the name of the foreign investor, who was a certain man coming in for Saudi Arabia, called Bin Laden, who, who was living just one villa away from Mullah Omar in Kandahar at the time. We are, we are talking in November 1997. And when, when I went back, I told the Americans everything. I did the meeting with all donors of the program, and I uh, say to them what I'm saying to you now about uh, Bin Laden included. So no one can say that they did not know about Bin Laden and, and, uh, and, 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 all, and all the rest. Anyway, they, then, then we started to have a very uncertain behavior on their side in the following years, but we were pushing them continuously. Maintaining always a degree of negotiation. I met them uh, in uh, Kandahar, I met them in Pakistan, that, where they had an office, an important office, and they had also another very important office in New York, uh, where they, they dealt with all countries. Office made by uh, two people, a man and a woman, a woman who, who was coming with jeans, blue jeans, all around, a Taliban woman. Uh, I asked them, but how can you do that? Uh, if I make a picture of you now here and I send it to Afghanistan, what will happen to you? She said, nothing. I am here with the full 
a full uh, permission of the government. They know perfectly I, I am a diplomat and I'm authorized to talk with you and with anybody else and uh, to, dress, to dress this way. Well, well, um, they started to be uncertain. In some areas they were cooperating with us, discouraging cultivators. We, uh, the donors, got uh, quite disappointed and uh, withdrew their commitment for the program. That I continued to pursue the program, but donors funded our limited program in parts of Afghanistan, funded other parts of our program, but lost enthusiasm for the issue. Until the summer of 2001. In the summer of 2001, there was no opium production in Afghanistan. Because they, under pressure from us, also because they wanted to reco recover the, the um, trust that we lost in, into them because of their uncertainty in the following years. They, I insisted also for some sanctions by the Security Council against uh, them and so on. Uh, but we never, never, ever lost track with them. We always had a positive negotiating relationship with them. Also many other issues. I don't know, I want to go into too much details. Anyway, what happened? Zero production in Afghanistan. We could not believe it to our eyes. There was no production in a zero. Because they forbid the, the cultivation in uh, September, October, and there was not the pr production uh, of opium poppy in the country. So we demonstrated that it is possible to do not produce opium in Afghanistan. Year 2001, summer, 11th of September, same year, October, invasion of Afghanistan by USA with the full support of the international community, we gave to the United States a blank check in post-September, post-11th post of September events. They invaded the country and we were, we were hoping that we would consolidate the result. On, the, on our side, we are dealing with the drug control. So I spoke with all the State Department officials responsible for narcotics, they told me, yes, 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 we will uh, tell all the, our military that we, we got this huge result, also thanks to your intervention to the United, and all the rest. Uh, be sure that this result will be confirmed in the, the following years. Well. What happened was exactly the opposite. Because the top American leaders, starting with the Secretary of Defense, Rumsfeld, they went to Afghanistan, and he personally did a set of agreements with the main warlords of Afghanistan, the enemies of the Taliban, the leader of the Northern Alliance, on, uh, fi on uh, fighting together terrorism, which was <laughs> in large part a Northern Alliance <laughs> uh, outgrowth, uh, in, in exchange, not written exchange and so on, but they put aside the narcotic issue, basically giving a de facto green light cultivation. that the next year jumped again to huge levels. Also, at the end of the same year, we had discovered by data that Russian intelligence gave us a full set of deposits of heroin on the border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. But uh, uh, there are 40 deposits of heroin for a total of 100 uh, tons of heroin. 
100 tons of heroin is the demand of all Western Europe in one year. So uh, traffickers pr built this set of, uh, of uh, warehouses where they are stocking <coughs> huge amounts, amounts of heroin. We have the picture of these deposits and I went to the Security Council asking for an intervention. First I spoke, of course, with the Americans uh, and uh, with others, the five permanent members of the Security Council. The Americans uh, uh, were extremely embarrassed. They did a big meeting of all the US agencies involved and the conclusion was they would be neutral. They could not corroborate and support our intervention to eliminate, to destroy these laboratories, and they could not oppose. Because the reason was very simple, told me the State Department the top, uh, they were one man of Albright. The reason was that they were, could not admit that they did not discover this, that we did it. Yes, if we go to the Congress, and we say that your agency, which has a $70 million budget, uh, did this. In the Senate, they will immediately ask for destroying <laughs> us and all the other deal, because we spent in the area several uh, billions of dollars in intelligence, in, in, in everything. Uh, you arrived there, uh, how much did you pay? For the, I told them that it was the Russian intelligence who gave us the data and, and so on and so on and so on. How much did you spend? I told him around two hundred thousand dollars, thousand dollars. So if I go there and I say that you with two hundred thousand dollars UN did this, and we did had no idea about this, so many people will lose their job that the final result was. Neutral, neutrality. I went to the Security Council with the old data, with the maps. I we showed them the maps with the laboratories and so on and so on. So, and we had several options of what to do. The simplest thing was a very simple intervention, destroying uh, Russians at the time had 10,000 people on the border uh, of Tajikistan. Uh, they could do this with, with nothing with a very extremely small uh, well, lack of everything at the time, we could finance with a very small amount. I could do it also with my personal fund as director of the program. We could do eliminate this like this. But of course, we need a, a, a mandate by the Security Council. Mandate never arrived because of the frontal opposition of the British. The UK said that we the first they told me that I should not even talk about it. When I told them that I, I was working for uh, the United Nations and not for the Queen of England, they, <laughs> they said you will pay for that. <laughs> and I paid <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> but <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, the Security Council listened to all this uh, huge presentation. The uh, UK put a veto on continuing the discussion and uh, Everything uh, died, died this way. Just to conclude the story, what we demonstrated. We demonstrated with, with the minimum investment of resources, with uh, a close negotiation with the Taliban, you can get these results. We could get the results again, and this is what I'm just proposed to my country, uh, I wrote to the, my president, Mr. Draghi, the prime minister, saying that uh, the EU, and Italy in particular, should uh, uh, start proposing again the Taliban to repeat what they did in the summer of 2001. Funding an alternative development program that would cost not more, doing it immediately, not in five years or ten years, now Afghanistan is not the same of 20 years ago. This can be done really in one year with the modest investment of less than $100 million a year not for not more than three, four years. Uh, the answer of my Prime Minister was, 
Oh, yes. Proposal is very good. It makes sense a lot. But it's the UN who should do it. I told him, look, UN is not the world government. UN is an association of states. We are the UN. They say they will talk about it in the EU Council and, uh, and, all, and all the rest. Why I'm saying that this to you now? Because I believe that this is still feasible and the chances of success are much bigger now than 15 or 20 years ago. Because uh, uh, also Talib, Taliban are, are basically the same. They, they're not new, old or Taliban and so on, but, uh, but the same. But of course, as a government of a country, they have to deliver things. And the most important thing for the European point of view that they could deliver is the elimination of narcotic production that struck directly one million and a half young Europeans, men and women. So this should be number one uh, priority within a humanitarian intervention that uh, my colleague Hussein already explained in a great, in a great detail, and that would be uh, the, uh, at minimum cost from the European Union. European Union, in my report, I demonstrated that spends every year one billion dollar euros in uh, non-military intervention in Afghanistan. One billion euros are enough if they get into the hand of the Afghan people. They are enough to sustain a process of change and develop in Afghanistan. But the main obstacle in this case is another one. is the fact that out of one billion, I discovered in my, the, in the investigation I did for my report, out of one billion, only 20% arrives in Afghanistan. I collect all figures of member states, and it's one billion. But when I went to Afghanistan, and I saw the data from the Treasury and so on, the real money that arrived from the EU and so on was 200 million. I calculated that out of these 200 million, 50% end up in the pockets of Afghan minister, president, and all the rest. So to the people of Afghanistan, one-tenth of this figure arrived. You say, where is the 80%? The 80% is what I call, I call it um, the legal corruption. It is not corruption, it's waste. That sometimes is corruption, sometimes waste, and so on, which is uh, a huge amount of money that stays in the, the donor area. Only EU spends uh, between 15 and 20 percent of every project in consultancies. Consultancies, feasibility plan, consultants, visits, and so on. The, the data that they gave to me is 15 percent. Then you have a huge amount of uh, waste into the channel. This money goes uh, to some NGO who, in turn, put this money in the hands of another NGOs. Or then you have not only NGOs. That are, NGOs are the best part of the story. Huh? NGOs are the best part. Then it goes also to specialized uh, companies technical companies and so on, who overcharge every, everything they do in, uh, in Afghanistan. So a road that would cost uh, one million is, uh, is uh, written in the books at 10 million. Whatever you do in Afghanistan is charged between 10 and uh, uh, 5 to 10 times its real value. A school in Afghanistan. I was in Herat. Uh, and I saw the Italian army was there. Herat was a quite safe area in Afghanistan, and uh, so the uh, army had nothing to do than do some social work projects, a couple of million dollar projects that the government of Italy gave to them. And so I visited all projects. 
the army was outside this, the chain of international aid. It was an army, very simple. So I visited this, and I discovered that the school cost $100,000. An hospital cost a couple of million dollars. When I saw the books of the regular international intervention, a school cost one million and a hospital cost 20 million. At that time, I uh, was there. In all, the, uh, in all the country, there was just one pediatric hospital in all Afghanistan. A country at that time was less than 30 million. One pediatric hospital. And 20,000 women died for delivery every year. 20,000. So for them, the real problem was not the war. The war had a casualty much inferior to this. The real problem for them was health and so on. And I measured this huge amount of waste that uh, must be absolutely reformed. With the, unfortunately, now, after 20 years, you have a be much better program of assistance. There are international experiences that show that with uh, this money, you can have a much better effect delivering money directly like Brazilian experiments demonstrate. Chinese experiment of poverty, poverty elimination is probably the best in the world in obtaining effect. So now the chain of delivery is improving. This is the reason why I'm saying that it, it, EU should not make any special effort for Afghanistan. Should simply deliver the international aid that delivered in the last 20 years for non-military purposes in a better a more efficient way. Narcotics is just one part of it, not the biggest. And uh, for sure, for sure, this can be a very strong argument of a negotiation with the Taliban. I can guarantee you that on a table of a negotiation with the Taliban, putting on the table re the recognition of the government and a serious program of international aid, government will capitulate on the issue of women. I'm, I'm sure, because I know them, I know them. The issue of women for them is, and I don't like this of course, is just the subject of negotiation. They do it to, to raise the price of negotiation. They know perfectly what we think about them and women. They, they know perfectly what we think. And they do for purpose these restrictions uh, policy of, on women because they know that this is an issue very hot for us that they can, on which they can extract uh, power, money, and recognition. But this is an operation that must be done. What is the other way? They were around. was described by Hussein. Not doing nothing, let the country starving, people continue to die, Taliban collapse, and they gain instability, terrorism, and uh, uh, violence, and whatever the Afghanistan got in the last 40 years returning on, on the stage. It's not very difficult to make this provision. If the Taliban collapse, the country, Go, goes every day again into a complete chaos. And it is possible to talk with them. They are extremists, they are not, uh, I mean, normal people. They won a, an independence war. They are radicals. It is natural. You never saw a movement that fought for 20 years, arriving to power and being uh, like a government of Denmark. I mean, people, people project on the Taliban, the government of Denmark, tolerant, inclusive, respective of uh, uh, everybody's rights and so on. I mean, these people, I met these people, they fought for 20 years with a Kalashnikov, a cup of tea and a piece of bread. They now have power. And they don't, the, the, the issue is they, if they are not helped, if they are not pressed, they, they can make mistakes. Like, they, they are not up to the job. 
And this, this also is quite normal. When I went to South Africa, after the end of apartheid, immediately after the big war for apartheid, the government of South Africa was made by people absolutely incompetent. I have to say, I've always been supportive of their fight since the beginning and so on. So I went there with a big idea about, about it. I went to Soweto, the first thing I did, go to Soweto, and I saw a terrible situation. Terrible. Of Soweto was plenty of violence, drug, drug mm -hmm. consumption all over and so on. I talked with all the ministers and, and so on, and they were totally inadequate to their job. They had a very vague idea on what to do. Because they were fighters. They were not <coughs> uh, um, administrators. And this process, transforming fighters into administrators, is very long, difficult, that um, uh, many other countries did with different results. Algeria is another example of a total failure. Liberation movement that took power against a very strong colonial power that was France. And the result was that they were incapable of building a modern uh, uh, Algeria. They are still trying to build it. So these are difficult processes that should be understood before launching uh, sentences and the judgment uh, and all the rest. Maybe I'll stop. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Alaki. And I, I appreciate why Helga Sepp-Larus, the international president of the Schiller Institute, proposed that the Western countries should make you a special representative for Afghanistan to have a common approach of how to do this thing. And in that connection, I was just reflect as a Dane. You say that when you first set up the program, Denmark was one of the main sponsors. You know, doing above its share of funding how to get rid of narcotics. It's very ironic that later we find the Danish troops being deployed in the Helmand province under the leadership of the British troops and going around year after year after year doing the fighting while uh, the puppy seats. I think the numbers was it was going up by a 30 fold during this uh, liberation from British, <laughs> British and Danish troops. And therefore, when, when the Danish government right now is sitting, thinking through what went wrong, they could actually go back to what we did then and say, we, we have a moral obligation to do this right again. And what better way than helping out directly funding and contributing to such a program of saying, now we want to get rid of the puppies and we want to instead to have real economic development. But that's just me as a day <laughs> reflecting on this. Now I would like very much to give the word to His Excellency Ahmad uh, Farooq, the ambassador uh, of Pakistan to Denmark. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom, and uh, thank you very much uh, to the Schiller Institute for uh, organizing this event uh, on a very important issue, uh, the future of Afghanistan, and uh, which way we would uh, like uh, it to move forward, uh, and for uh, giving uh, me uh, this opportunity of uh, presenting Pakistan's perspective uh, on, 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 on this uh, uh, su subject. Um, so what I have to say would not be uh, the kind of story that, what, uh, which uh, Professor Adlaki just narrated, and it was more enjoyable, especially due to his Italian gestures. Uh, but I would like uh, to begin with uh, just to put uh, some context uh, into uh, what uh, now Pakistan feels uh, uh, should happen uh, with regards to Afghanistan with a bit of history of how we uh, saw, uh, uh, we see this situation has evolved <coughs> over the last uh, 40 years. Because Afghanistan has been uh, in a state of turmoil for 40 years and not uh, much is said that the conflict actually started in 
1979 and not in uh, 2001. And Pakistan, along with Afghanistan, has been uh, facing its uh, fallout for the last uh, 40, 40 years. Uh, the withdrawal uh, of the Soviet troops uh, in 1988 was followed by a civil war uh, that took place between the different factions of the Mujahideen uh, that were fighting uh, the Soviets. And a key, re key reason uh, for that uh, to happen was uh, that once this objective uh, of expelling uh, the Soviets uh, from Afghanistan was achieved. Uh, the West decided, West uh, and, and the US, they decided to uh, walk away from Afghanistan. Uh, and if they had stayed there and had supported uh, the peace building process in that country, perhaps the history of that country would have been much different. Um, and from this chaos of the civil war, uh, you know, we saw Afghanistan descend, uh, you know, into the top uh, drug producing country in the world. Uh, it became a, a safe uh, haven uh, for uh, the international terrorist groups, Al Qaeda in particular, and organized crime that was going on there. And the Taliban basically, they emerged uh, from uh, this chaos uh, of the civil war with the promise of uh, bringing uh, stability and peace to the country. What we remember, however, from uh, their rule is more, uh, you know, the kind of human rights violations uh, that were committed, especially uh, against women and girls. Um, and the, in, in, in the period uh, that followed uh, the September 2001 attacks, Afghanistan did make progress, you know, at least from the outside, one can say. Uh, but obviously, uh, as both uh, Professor Laki and uh, uh, Hussain, uh, uh, the, the facts that they have presented, actually, there were serious problems that were uh, not, uh, that remain unresolved. The conflict uh, continued to linger, and the country, country faced serious challenges uh, in terms of bad uh, governance, corruption of the various uh, Afghan governments. Um, the fact that there was never a clear uh, exit strategy uh, for the international community to come out of Afghanistan is basically what uh, you know, played a role uh, in uh, what, what we see today. And the fact that uh, we did, were not able to achieve uh, long-term peace in the country despite uh, the presence of such a large uh, international military presence, despite the fact that, as, as it is claimed, uh, you know, two or three uh, trillion dollars uh, were spent uh, in the country. Um, and basically, it's uh, eventually, uh, in the last two years, uh, the U.S. Uh, came to this uh, realization that there is no military solution and they have to get out of uh, Afghanistan. So at that point, uh, they decided to uh, talk uh, to the Taliban. Uh, Pakistan had been uh, advocating for a long time, you know, from, from the period when uh, Al-Qaeda had ceased to be uh, a threat uh, as, 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 as a terrorist entity, that there was a need for a a political process, a dialogue uh, in Afghanistan, because there could not be uh, any military uh, solution there. The Afghans, if you look at their history, they have never succumbed to uh, any foreign military pressure. So the Taliban were a political reality, and the Americans needed to talk to them. So eventually, when uh, the Americans decided to talk to them. Pakistan did play its role uh, in facilitating the dialogue process. However, we also advised them that uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan has to be uh, accompanied in tandem by progress uh, in, in the peace process. 
Uh, so once a withdrawal date uh, was set, and uh, which was not connected with the progress in, in the peace process, um, uh, the prospects of a political solution uh, faded. Um, the ultimate uh, collapse of the Afghan security forces uh, without putting up a fight uh, and the fleeing uh, of, uh, the, of uh, the former president uh, Ashraf Ghani and, and his associates has basically brought us uh, to where we uh, stand today. The four decades uh, of conflict in Afghanistan, you know, my figures may be a bit different from what Hussein presented. We, we believe over a million Afghans have been ha uh, killed, uh, injured, maimed, traumatized, uh, and uh, it, it has basically resulted in uh, destroying the polity and uh, the economy of the country. Uh, so the people of uh, Afghanistan, they desire peace, they desire development, and so uh, are Afghans, Afghanistan's neighbors, uh, especially uh, Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has a very long and complex uh, history uh, in terms of our relations with Afghanistan. And, of the, uh, and the last four decades have particularly been uh, the most difficult. Uh, the two countries are linked uh, inextricably uh, through ties of uh, geography, history, ethnicity, religion, and culture. Uh, and most importantly, Pakistan provides Afghanistan its lifeline. Afghanistan is a landlocked country, and most of its international trade takes place through Pakistan, as we have uh, a transit trade agreement uh, with them. Um, over the last four decades, Pakistan has hosted over three to four million refugees. Several generations uh, of Afghans have grown up in Pakistan and have not ever seen uh, their home country. So uh, no matter what happens in Afghanistan or whoever is in control of the country, it has serious ramifications for Pakistan. Uh, we do not have that luxury of walking away uh, you know, from that situation uh, as has been done uh, by the West twice. Um, for us, it has also been uh, a compulsion that whoever uh, is, is in control of, Pak uh, of Afghanistan, uh, we have to have some kind of a working relationship with them. Uh, we cannot simply, because you know, when you look uh, at the situation, if the trade of a country is going through Pakistan, we have a long border with them. Uh, there are people uh, who have ties, uh, tribal, uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, belong to the same tribe, they are crossing over. So all that requires that we uh, have to have a functional relationship uh, with the government, whether it's de jure or de facto. Um, now, in, in the entire duration of this uh, four decades of conflict, uh, Pakistan has been the country that has, after Afghanistan, uh, which has been the most affected by this conflict. In the initial period of the war, uh, we had to suffer the weaponization of our society. Uh, uh, we, we were affected by drugs coming in. Uh, we were affected by the pressure you know, of, the, of the refugees, because when they came in, uh, they, uh, it, it was not only the fact that they had to be housed, but they eventually, you know, with, with such large number of uh, people coming in, they destroyed our ecology, especially in the area uh, where they were uh, living in huge camps in those uh, days. And then, uh, following the September 2001 attacks, uh, the conflict, which was previously restricted to Afghanistan, was brought to within our own borders, as Pakistan became the battleground uh, for the fight between terrorist groups. So over these last uh, 20 years, we have suffered casualties of almost 80,000 and economic losses of over $150 billion. 
the, the return to normalcy uh, has been achieved at great cost, both in terms of the lives that we've lost, uh, as well as treasure. And that's what uh, our government and our people uh, want to preserve. Um, after now these decades of instability, Pakistan uh, wants to focus on its economic development. And a key aspect of that is regional connectivity. We want to reach out uh, to, especially to the countries uh, of Central Asia, to meet our energy needs uh, for promoting trade and attracting international investment. Um, the Prime Minister of Pakistan uh, has recently uh, outlined a, a policy of geoeconomics for the future of Pakistan rather than focusing on geopolitics of what we had been doing in the past. And a peaceful Afghanistan is the centerpiece of that. Without peace in Afghanistan, it is not possible for us to achieve the economic progress that we have uh, we, we desire for our future. Um, any continued instability uh, in Afghanistan, obviously, uh, in the shape of, uh, if, if God forbid, Afghanistan uh, def descends into a civil war, it, Pakistan will be the country, and perhaps our, our other neighbor, Iran, which will be most directly impacted by it in terms of terrorism uh, and uh, the spillover of refugees. Um, we continue to host over 3 million Afghan refugees, uh, and as I mentioned before, and we provide sustenance to them uh, through our own resources because the international assistance for the upkeep of refugees dried up somewhere in the early 90s. The Afghan refugees can access our health services, our educational institutions, our banking system, um, and they can earn a livelihood. The fact that, uh, you know, in this last 20 years, when supposedly uh, there was so much of money uh, that was being poured into Afghanistan, uh, and uh, there was no civil war, none of these refugees decided to go back to uh, Afghanistan. So if there had been any, uh, you know, uh, attraction for them, they would have left and gone back to their uh, home country because despite the fact that they are able to earn um, a livelihood in Pakistan, they are still don't, uh, even for uh, the children that have been born in uh, Pakistan, they don't enjoy Pakistani citizenship. They remain Afghan citizens. So they would have gone back to Afghanistan uh, if the situation there had presented them a better uh, option. Um, so now, uh, as we move forward, uh, Afghanistan stands at a, at a critical uh, juncture, uh, and the Afghan people, with the uh, support of the international community, can definitely build a better future for them. Um, learning from mistakes of the past, uh, you know, uh, we've seen now what happened in 1988, uh, and again, uh, the fact that uh, the West has decided to abandon, uh, to leave Afghanistan, it should not mean that they abandon Afghanistan. Uh, and because that will, obviously, it will uh, prolong the conflict and cause suffering for its people, which will not be uh, to the benefit of uh, anyone. Um, the recent humanitarian uh, uh, statistics, uh, you know, the st uh, statistics about the humanitarian situation which are coming out uh, from different UN agencies are quite alarming. Uh, so, uh, as per UNICEF, uh, 18 million Afghans are in urgent need of assistance, and over a million Afghan children are, uh, can suffer serious malnutrition and starvation in the coming months. So it is important uh, to prevent this situation from deteriorating uh, any further, because that will uh, create a huge humanitarian disaster that will affect not only uh, the region, uh, the, uh, Afghanistan itself, but the region and uh, other areas as well of the world. 
Um, so it, Pakistan believes that it is important uh, that we should provide access to Afghanistan's uh, you know, financial resources in order to prevent a further deterioration of the uh, of the, uh, uh, the you know the economic uh, economy of the country. Um, it is also essential to prevent inflation, rising prices, growing poverty, and preventing a mass exodus of refugees from the country. On 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 our part, Pakistan, uh, we are playing a role in terms of uh, assisting the uh, humanitarian situation in Afghanistan. Uh, and together with UN agencies, we have uh, developed an air bridge uh, that can, uh, through which uh, emergency supplies are being now airlifted to Afghanistan. That includes food and medical items. Pakistan itself has dispatched three plane loads uh, of uh, emergency equipment, especially medical supplies to Pakistan, and we are continuing to do so uh, especially food aid through the land corridor. Uh, this fact was recently uh, acknowledged uh, by uh, the uh, visiting U.S. Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman. She was in Islamabad on Friday. She appreciated that and acknowledged that and uh, encouraged Pakistan uh, to continue doing that. Uh, we are also, in terms of the overall political environment, uh, in consultations with uh, all the neighbors of Afghanistan, uh, including uh, China, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, uh, and also uh, Russia, uh, in finding a long-term peaceful uh, solution uh, for the country. Um, we, are, we continue to call on Afghanistan uh, and, and, and the Taliban uh, to, uh, to form an open, inclusive governmental structure that practices moderate and sound uh, you know, policies with regards especially uh, to the human rights uh, 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 and, and ethnic groups, women and children. Uh, terrorism, since we have been a major victim of terrorism that has emanated from uh, Afghanistan, so that remains for us a major concern. Uh, and so we call upon, we have been calling upon the Taliban that they should not uh, allow the use of their territory by uh, the various terrorist groups that are present there. Uh, Pakistan is also part of uh, the extended Troika format. So that includes China, Russia, the US, uh, and Pakistan is the fourth country uh, in terms of uh, finding the political solution uh, options uh, for Afghanistan. Um, so uh, I believe, uh, as, as my uh, other uh, co-panelists have said, this is a time where the international community has to apply a different approach uh, for bringing peace uh, in Afghanistan. Military options have been tried and they have failed. So we have to look uh, towards how we can help uh, Afghanistan develop economically. Uh, and uh, you know there has to be an engagement and incentivized approach, uh, as, as Professor Laki also mentioned, um, in uh, encouraging uh, the Taliban to uh, do what we expect of them. Uh, so in conclusion, I would uh, again, once again, like to uh, thank uh, the Schiller Institute for uh, organizing this very important uh, debate. Uh, and, and indeed, we would like uh, to continue working with, uh, with you uh, in, in uh, finding answers. Uh, and at the end, I would just like to uh, state uh, that you know the national poet of uh, Pakistan, uh, his name is uh, Iqbal, and the Iranians know him as Iqbal Lahori. He said somewhere in uh, the early 20th century, in the 1920s, about Afghanistan, that uh, Afghanistan is the heart of Asia. Uh, so that's where the name of that uh, political process, Heart of Asia, Istanbul process, comes. Uh, if there is peace in Afghanistan, there is peace in Asia. And if there is unrest in Afghanistan, there will be unrest in Asia. Thank you very much.
Following is a statement from the Chinese embassy in Denmark on Afghanistan that was submitted to the Schiller Institute seminar on Afghanistan. As a close neighbor of Afghanistan, China has always respected its sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity, adhered to non-interference in its internal affairs, and pursued a friendly policy towards all Afghanistan people. We hope that the Taliban will build a broad-based and inclusive political structure, pursue moderate and prudent domestic and foreign policies, protect the rights of women and children, resolutely combat terrorist forces, and develop friendly and cooperative relations with its neighbors and other countries. We sincerely hope that Afghanistan can find a development path suitable to its national conditions. To meet the immediate needs of the Afghan people, China has announced that it will provide 200 million RMB worth of supplies to Afghanistan, including 3 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines. When the security and other conditions allow, China is willing to assist Afghanistan to build projects that will help improve livelihoods and will do its best to support Afghanistan in its peaceful reconstruction and economic development. We call upon the international community to play a constructive role in Afghanistan's peaceful reconstruction on the basis of respecting the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Afghanistan, respecting the will of the Afghan people, and adhering to the Afghan-led and Afghan-owned principle. We need to have more dialogue and give more advice to the new authority in Afghanistan without any prejudice or preconceived idea and we should not create any difficulty for them. Humanitarian assistance is of utmost urgency. Economic sanctions must stop. Unilateral sanctions or restrictions on Afghanistan should be lifted. The country's foreign currency reserves are national assets that should not be used as a bargaining chip to exert political pressure on Afghanistan. The abrupt change in Afghanistan reminds us, once again, that military intervention and power politics do not have popular support, and foreign model and the so-called democratic transformation are not sustainable. What relevant countries have done in Afghanistan in the past 20 years has ended in failure. They should seriously re reflect on it and correct mistakes timely, instead of walking away from the problems of their own doing and leaving them to Afghanistan and other countries in the region. After all, they bear the inescapable political, security, economic, and humanitarian responsibilities for Afghanistan and are more obliged than other countries to help Afghanistan maintain stability, prevent chaos, and embark on the road of peace and reconstruction. They should earnestly honor their commitment to the Afghan people and take concrete actions to participate in the international community's assistance efforts in Afghanistan. From our Zoom audience, we have a message from Helga Zeppler Rouge, who is the uh, founder and chairman of the International Schiller Institute. 
and she writes, please tell the seminar that the Schiller Institute plans to have a day of action internationally this coming Thursday demanding the release of the funds, in other words, the Afghanistan government funds that are right now being frozen in the United States and other uh, countries since the uh, Taliban came to power. And she continues, maybe if other forces around the world would join this, it will make the demand stronger. The following is the statement by the representative of Iran's embassy in Denmark to the Schiller Institute seminar on Afghanistan. The representative of the embassy of the Islamic Republic of Iran at this seminar, whilst emphasizing the need for an inclusive government, respect for civil and democratic rights of all citizens, without discrimination in Afghanistan, highlighted the important role the neighboring countries can play in helping peace and security to be established in the country and alleviating the sufferings of its people. He pointed out that with terrorist activities in the region and with drug production in Afghanistan reaching record levels, the security and law enforcement forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran in the past four decades have been constantly engaged in combating terrorism and drug smuggling along its 900 kilometer border with Afghanistan and have suffered casualties in their efforts to close off this route for drugs reaching the West. Throughout this period, Iran has also hosted millions of Afghan refugees, estimated to have peaked at 4 million, accommodating and providing them with health and educational services on par with that afforded to its own population, including COVID-19 vaccination. This has been a heavy burden on Iran, given the fact that, contrary to other refugee host nations, the country has received little or no assistance from the international community. With the recent developments in Afghanistan, an influx of new refugees from that country, expected to reach half a million, is already taking place, and Iran, with its ability to help new arrivals hampered by the heaviest sanctions under the U.S. maximum pressure campaign, is doing all it can to help its Afghan brethren, while cooperating with the U.N. agencies to help address the problems facing the people of Afghanistan. In one important move, the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, with due regard to the importance of providing education for Afghan refugee children, called on the Iranian authorities to register, free of charge, Afghan children at Iranian schools alongside their Iranian brothers and sisters. Finally, the Islamic Republic of Iran considers the active involvement of all Afghanistan's neighbors paramount in any moves towards addressing these issues and is willing to continue to play a positive role in the efforts to achieve goals desired and shared by all Afghans.
the, uh, the ability of terrorists and, and uh, separatist groups to be active and recruit people is dependent on the fact that there are frustrated people in that community. It's not that they're only frustrated because of political oppression, they're frustrated because their government is not offering them anything. And therefore, all these, uh, this so-called war on terrorism has been a failure because it does not address the real needs of those societies by, for example, building infrastructure, providing health care, uh, education, work for people. I mean, we have now the whole sub-Saharan Africa region. NATO, the France, the United States, they have hundreds of military operations in sub-Saharan Africa. The problem is that the regular armies of these nations, like in Mali, in Niger, in, in those countries, first of all, they were devastated by, by what happened in Libya, because there were massive amounts of weapons and militants moved from Libya into their countries. But the other thing is that those nations are not capable of paying their own security forces and soldiers because the economy is in such a bad shape. So Boko Haram, for example, they have more resources than the government to finance fighters and recruit young people who are angry and frustrated because they, have, they get lots of resources from the smuggling of cocaine uh, to Europe. Or they have uh, sponsors in, 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 in certain countries. So the ability of a nation to fight terrorism is actually very much in, dependent on its ability to sustain its economy and build a, a strong military and uh, security response. But the, you cannot, I mean, you have in, in, in some cases, if, the population, it's not the military and security forces who will defeat the terrorists. It is if the population is on your side, which can help you defeat it. If, you, if the population is against you, then everything you do in terms of military or security will, will not work. I mean, we have many cases, like even in Iraq and other, other areas, where the population starts supporting these groups instead of the government, because they are so frustrated with the government, and the government is destroying their livelihood. So that's, I think it should be a lesson from now on that in order to be able to solve the problem with terrorism, I mean, if you have a legitimate government in that country, you have to support that government with economic aid, not only with military and security aid. I can uh, add to that. Uh, you know, the uh, United Nations has what is known as the Global uh, Counterterrorism Strategy, uh, which is uh, every two years renewed by the General Assembly. So it's based on four pillars, and one of the pillars is addressing the underlying causes of terrorism. So within that, uh, you know, uh, uh, addressing the economic uh, sort of deprivations is one of the reasons that has been identified. So it's, it's a document which is, uh, uh, you know, it's a consensus document agreed by all members of the United Nations. So it's, it's a very important aspect of why people, uh, you know, not everybody is uh, just ideologically motivated uh, to join terrorist groups. There are economic deprivations uh, which also uh, cause people to join them, you know, uh, as we have experienced uh, in our part of the world, that the terrorist groups perhaps offer uh, better wages that the, uh, people could find, uh, you know, uh, they are un unemployed or they are unable to meet their ex uh, living expenses. So they offer good money, uh, uh, like a monthly wage uh, to, to uh, their uh, members. So, really? Yeah. They That's even offer uh, retirement and uh, no. No, the victims, I mean, the family of a, they take a care killed of families, terrorist, yeah. they will also get support so they can recruit more. The problem is that the, 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 the failed security policy of the United States, for example, in, in Afghanistan and in, uh, in Pakistan, it actually, they help recruit more people by bombing civilians and killing you know, people in weddings and funerals. So the angry people who see that, they would naturally join the, the militants rather than join the United States' war against terrorism. Yeah, it's, it's a crucial point. Crucial point. Probably the most important one. The international terrorism 
since five years is decreasing drastically is more than 50% decrease of international <coughs> terrorist attack and dead. Huge. Pakistan has 80% decrease in terrorism attack. Iraq, huge decrease. And uh, also other countries had huge decreases. So no, no one of the so-called official experts on terrorism predicted this. Everybody was t talking about an escalation of terrorism. So at a certain point, five years ago, year by year, huge decrease. Why? <coughs> the connection with the decision of the USA administration to withdraw troops and to de-escalate intervention, aerial bombing, in the Middle East, particularly Syria, particularly Iraq, and Afghanistan as well, is the most obvious explanation that no one advanced. Because it is very difficult, it is unpolitic, not politically correct, to say that most of this international terrorism is a reaction of the wars in the Middle East. Why Italy was not bombed? And was, France was bombed. No, we got uh, between 2015 and 2016 a set of terrorist attack in Europe concentrated France and Belgium. Almost 300 people died. So last year the Economist wrote an article saying why Italy has never been affected by international Islamic terrorism since 20 years. We never got it. And the explanation was because of the mafia. <laughs> because they, they say that uh, uh, the Mafia forbid international terrorists to bomb Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote a letter to the economists. They published it. And I said that the idea of the Mafia is very stupid because the Mafia is busy now to try to survive and they never got this power to impede terrorism. I mean, they cannot care less about terrorism in Italy and so on. The, the real reason is that we never bombed Syria. We never bombed Iraq and never bombed Afghanistan. Italy, Germany, Scandinavian countries never bombed anybody. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, I mean, there is a reason why in Scandinavia the only serious terrorist attack was by a crazy guy from the extreme right years ago that killed 15 people. Uh, but in why they don't do that? There is a clear reason that Italy has never been bombed. It would never in the past. Because Italy, Germany, Germany got just one small terrorist attack at Christmas three years ago. Never. Because Italy, Germany, and Scandinavian countries never participate to aerial bombing in the Middle East. We never use troops to combat on the ground and so on. When people are killed, these people are not uh, animals. These people have, uh, have affects, have families, have somebody who, who of course, uh, resent this. You cannot continue to bomb the country. They did 5,000 aerial attacks in Syria, killing in Afghanistan, killing people in weddings, killing people indiscriminately in funerals, and, and so on. With this, with this. Uh, uh, aerial bombing, modern and old, and, and so on. So the reason why internet is... Also now, you will see these statistics, that all American statistics, I'm quoting the best source, the best, I, I mean, the most uh, the widespread source is uh, the, the University of Maryland database on, on terrorist attack. Next, the next year, since the Taliban were considered a terrorist, wrongly, this the, the decrease that I'm quoting will be 80 percent. 
There will be just, uh, if you take out the Middle East uh, route of terrorism, in the rest of the world, there are very few examples now of active uh, terrorist groups. Africa, Africa, Mali terrorists. Mali terrorists was largely increased by the French intervention. Now they decided to withdraw all their troops because they decided, they realized that they were uh, increasing the terrorism instead of Somalia. The same was the, the, this reckless intervention of foreign troops, particularly the Americans, that created this reaction. This is a fact that is very, I'm saying, very obvious thing. Twenty years ago, the Pentagon was not afraid of saying that. I, I read a very important document of the Pentagon who said it is our overextension in the world that is creating this reaction. So terrorism is largely a, a, a threat that has been created by this. And the best way Sometimes they ask me, what is your recipe to fight terrorism? Because I, I played some role in fighting the mafia in my country. Ah, well, what is your recipe to fight terrorism? I, simply, don't bomb countries. <laughs> Stop bombing. Stop bombing. And, and, you, will see, and you will see how, how terrorism will decrease. I, I just want to say, I just want to say on that note, of course, that Denmark has been the subject of terrorist attacks for the very explicit reason that Denmark since 2001 under Anders Fogh Rasmussen has been under, you know, he used to be, pro before he went to be head of NATO, he was prime minister of Denmark, ah, Anders yes, Fogh Rasmussen. Yes. And started doing it, was already going a little bit, but having as, as a stated policy, this militaristic foreign policy that if there is a war, where bombs are being thrown, then especially in Middle East, Denmark, of course, should be in there throwing bombs. Uh -huh. So we have been bombing in Libya, we have been bombing in Syria, we have been bombing away. So Denmark is the exception to this peaceful but you, but tranquility. You've got many international Islamic terrorist attack. We, if we've had it compared to people the, dead or just we we we've. We've, Denmark is a very homogene country, so, but there's been quite a few that also, there's been some successful and some that has been stopped uh, for this reason. And, and, and therefore that should just be saying what you said, should be obvious when in Denmark you're now, there is this process of trying to discuss what should be the policy forward for Denmark that the first thing I think everybody should agree on is this militaristic fault policy, this idea of intervention with military means has to stop. Peacekeeping troops like Denmark, like other Scandinavian countries used to do in Cyprus and many different places, that's very good. Peacekeeping, Peacekeeping troops, yeah, but that's a totally different it's matter. That is to, to prevent nothing war. Nothing to do, yes. Uh, uh, so prevent anyway. Prevent Uh, UN is, uh, un <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> UN is out of the picture. That was the decision that Kofi Annan took. When uh, uh, Afghanistan was invaded, there was a big discussion at the top of the UN what to do. And uh, Kofi and the group of others decided that we should stay away. The argument was that uh, they invaded the country, they have to take care of the country, should not uh, drop to us uh, the issue like they used to do. When they have a difficult issue, they drop it to the UN. So we should not play this game. Now they take care of the country. Uh, uh, my position and the other position was not, was not I would not, did not agree that UN should be on the ground to avoid the occupation that at that time was very popular. <coughs> we, 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 the first moment of the uh, Afghanistan invasion, there was a very large consensus all over the world on that. But we were afraid that as any occupation of a foreign country 
end up the same way, badly. So just to prevent what really happened afterwards, we had to be on the ground with a big force. And uh, we also planned to, to strengthen our presence in Afghanistan with a special uh, force, UN, UN force and so on. And at that time, we could also get the support of uh, the member states. But Kofi and the others insisted on, on uh, us playing a minimum role, staying away, and so on. They prevailed, well, Secretary General, you know, prevails all the time. And, and nothing happened. Now, would be the moment, it could be the moment for the UN to step in. But uh, this is a question that we should raise with the Secretary General. The UN could play a big role in reconstructing Afghanistan and, uh, and uh, talking with the Taliban that were always in contact with us. We never lost uh, contact with, with the Taliban. Uh, why do not be at the forefront of that? Yeah, I think I, uh, at, 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 you know, as you had mentioned in your comments, uh, that the UN is also, it's like an association of states. So its policies, its agenda is driven, by, it's state driven. And within those states, there are certain states that, you know, have to take the lead, which includes the US, uh, you know, the permanent members of the Security Council, or uh, also, you know, when it comes to uh, the development side, uh, the European Union. So unless they take the lead, because they are the ones who are going to uh, foot the bill, the money has to come from somewhere. Uh, so unless uh, you know they take the lead, uh, the UN on its own cannot move. It doesn't have the resources. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I, there was a, a, a shift in the 90s to replace the United Nations with what we have now, it has evolved into what the people in the West call rules-based order. That has nothing to do with the United Nations Charter or uh, international law. These are rules created by powerful institutions and military industrial complexes and think tanks in the West. Prime Minister Tony Blair in 1997 started that process through in his speech in the Chicago University, where he said the era of the peace of Westphalia, which established the fact that nations are sovereign and independent, is over. That's an obsolete principle because we, the civilized world, the democratic free world, should have the right to determine if a dictator is legitimate or not. If he's oppressing his people, we should have the right to intervene with military means to change that leader or that government. So then we had the whole series of the 9-11, post-9-11 wars, uh, uh, Afghanistan, and then the worst case was Iraq because the United Nations it was against it. But then the, the Americans and the British said, well, we will go our way. Then, So in that sense, they wanted to demolish the United Nations Charter, the role of the United Nations, not as a world government, but as a, a forum where nations can agree and meet and agree on very important issues as independent sovereign nations and prevent war and establish peace. Now, there is a move by China and Russia to, I think it's called the, the Friends of the United Nations, uh, of the UN Charter. Because they say we should go back to the United Nations Charter, which has actually its roots in the Peace of Westphalia Treaty. That nations are independent and sovereign, that nations should work together to establish peace and prosperity everywhere. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need just to go back to the UN Charter and international law established on that basis. And this is what these people who have launched all these wars and the, and the economic and financial interest behind them, they want perpetual war. It's like a perpetual revolution, there where there is no rule except the rules they set according to their interests and desires. And that's very, very dangerous. And therefore, going back not to the UN as a world government, but the UN Charter 
and the principles which were established after World War II, that would guarantee. I mean, even the question uh, our friends uh, raised, the question of sanctions, that economic sanctions, you know, indiscriminate economic sanctions should be forbidden internationally because in every single case, they both uh, created massive suffering for the population and they did not force these governments to change their policies. We had, I come from Iraq, we had in the 1990s, we had criminal sanctions where we lost 500,000 children. And State Secretary Madeleine Albright said, well, that's a reasonable price to control Saddam Hussein. Well, you didn't change Saddam Hussein's behavior. He was changed with a military invasion, which removed him by force. But the sanctions did not make the Iraqi government change its policy. It's the people who suffer. We have a generation of young people whose development is stunted, who are easily manipulated. They can very easily join terrorist groups and, and milita militias and so on. So this idea also, this using economic sanctions against nations, this should also stop not only launching wars yeah. on fake bases. Substituting war. I think, uh, you know, as far as uh, China and Pakistan are concerned, uh, it, it, once there is peace in uh, Afghanistan and uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the corridor could be expanded uh, to uh, Afghanistan, it would have sig significant uh, peace dividends uh, for the regional countries. But the primary uh, uh, issue here is that, uh, you know, you need a government in Afghanistan that is recognized uh, internationally. Uh, and uh, unless that happens, you cannot expect uh, international investment to start pouring into uh, the country. As I, as I mentioned in my uh, comments, for us uh, and China, obviously, China is the country that has uh, launched this Belt and Road Initiative. So, uh, they see uh, the future uh, of their economic progress in uh, regional uh, integration. And we also, uh, uh, you know, as I uh, highlighted, that our prime minister has come up with this uh, vision of uh, geoeconomics. So that is based on regional connectivity. Uh, and f uh, within that, Afghanistan is, is at, in the middle of everything. Uh, you know, if, as, as uh, Hussain mentioned, this uh, gas pipeline that was planned from Turkmenistan and ending up in India cannot be built uh, if there is no peace in Afghanistan. So similarly, there, the prospects are there, but we need to have a set of, uh, you know, conditions on the ground that allow that uh, to happen. Uh, and Pakistan is, is, is uh, you know, we, we see it as part of our uh, future growth uh, that we integrate uh, regionally uh, through Afghanistan with countries uh, in the Central Asia. We can deploy the Taliban to protect the infrastructure construction companies. In, in Iraq, for example, because everything in Iraq was destroyed, but only oil production was pr protected. Now, they brought international security firms, Blackwater, uh, Sandlines, which is the British, the Aegis, and those companies' major job was to protect the production and transport of oil from Iraq, and they succeeded. So that kind of infrastructure was allowed to succeed, protected by mercenary troops, by you know, very well-paid mercenaries, but you can deploy the Taliban fighters, who are very good fighters, to protect the infrastructure projects which are proposed to be built. And also because they know the local community. Because, you, you know, terrorist groups don't come from a very far area to attack a certain. They need to have an, what you call, incubator. I mean, I, I know, I lived in northern Iraq in Kurdish area. And uh, when I was like 10 years, there was the Kurdish Iraqi, uh, there was like civil war. And the Kurdish fighters will descend in the evening 
into the city and attack the posts of the security and police people, and then they would disappear. Now, the road to the mountains is very far. But what they used to do is that they had collaborators in the city who will hide them. They disappeared. Yeah. So unless you have the population on your side, you cannot fight terrorism and separatist groups. And therefore, I think in the case of Afghanistan, a good idea. Very good idea. you should deploy the Taliban, pay them a good wage Very to good protect idea vital economic interest of the nation in their local areas, not to move them away, because they, should, they need to be near their families. And to protect that kind of economic projects would be in the interest of their own families, and therefore they would be more serious uh, protecting it. And in addition, they can get uh, a wage. And then the rest of the youth you can deploy, like President Franklin Roosevelt did after the Great Depression. They had these uh, uh, special uh, uh, it's called the CCC, a special camps for unemployed people. They get professional training. Even if they don't have any skills, they are sent to, uh, to work on uh, what they did in the United States in uh, environmental conservation, because most of the trees were cut and land was degraded. Planting trees, doing things, and those people will learn a skill while they get paid a, a wage, a limited wage, uh, most of it will go to their families, and then they keep the rest as pocket money uh, while they are on these uh, working camps. Uh, we can have a modern version of that for people who want to immediately need to repair the roads, bridges, and all these things. So therefore, you can recruit lots of young people in these smaller projects right now to repair the, the, the roads and bridges and water and so on. And at the same time, they will get uh, uh, some income, but they also they learn the skills which they will use later when the big infrastructure projects uh, come in with the foreign investors. So there are ways to, to tackle these things, but uh, you have to work locally. You have to also care for the people of that country. And just what Helga Sepp-Larouche says, for that Exactly for that reason, this issue of actually restoring the sovereignty of Afghanistan, releasing the funds that they have around the world, which actually is absolutely needed right now, simply to buy base, you know, to have energy, to have all of these things, is clearly a very key part of it, that, that this has to be done. You can't just say that this is going to be a permanent non-country. <laughs> <laughs> because then you can't do anything. You have the, you have the UN uh, program for drug control, who has uh, 40 years' experience in uh, alternative development and drug eradication. We accumulated this experience in all parts of the world, so we know what works and what does not work. But in the case of Afghanistan, a comprehensive program uh, today cannot be done uh, like 30 years ago. A full uh, involvement of the government is absolutely indispensable. My proposal is to create a special agency, uh, national agency, Afghanistan national agency, that uh, use experts coming from the UN, coming from uh, the donor countries, uh, in order that the ownership of the program of eradication program and alternative development is belong to the government. We cannot work like 20 or 30 years ago, in which we did everything. We just told the government of Afghanistan what to do, not only the government of Afghanistan, other governments. We, in many cases, abused our credibility. We had, we had, we still have huge credibility outside the, the West. Uh, but uh, we used to, some time to abuse it. In this case, uh, uh, I see no, no, no counterindication. 
in creating a special, not diluting the issue of narcotics into a general program of agricultural development, having always a, a, a particular uh, pocket in order to do not lose the, the, the target, which is a, basically a Western target. People believe that Afghanistan, when you are land in Afghanistan, you see poppies here, poppies there, with this brilliant color everywhere and so on. <laughs> the um, poppy cultivation in Afghanistan is very difficult to see in a, in a map. I had always problem for that. It's so small, it's 0.5% of arable land. It is so small, you cannot see in a map. Uh, it's not like people believe that all countries have plenty of poppies uh, and so on. It's not that way. It is cultivated in particular areas, uh, not, very frequent, not easily accessible, and more and more remote areas. And even in uh, the areas like Herman province, where you have almost 50% of the production, it's not easy to see poppy cultivation. They're very small vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the agriculture. So, uh, the main interest uh, in, on narcotics is our interest, because it, the drugs come from there. So if you want to close the tap of drugs, natural drugs, in Europe, you have to be there and do what is necessary to do. With the goal of elimination, because there are also other proposals, sometimes quite bizarre, like uh, there was a proposal years ago to use, um, to permit opium cultivation and use all opium cultivation of Afghanistan for legal me medical purposes, which sounds fine. The problem is that all the legal demand for opium is always satisfied by three countries that are authorized by the UN, heavily controlled by the UN, and are enough to supply all the codeine that is necessary for the medical industry all over the world. But there is no shortage. You have already Australia, uh, India, and, uh, and Turkey who produce, uh, under UN authorization, what all uh, legal opium derivate that is necessary. Every year, a country send a, send a questionnaire to the International Narcotic Control Board, who is a special uh, narcotic board of the UN, uh, quoting his demand for his hospitals, for his treatment of terminal uh, patients, and so on. This body elaborates all this demand and assign to this country a certain quantity of legal, uh, is codeine, the main derivative for, for, and that is it. If there is an increase, they immediately transfer, authorize uh, Tasmania area in Australia, where most of it is produced, Turkey and the other country, to increase production which is done in a way that works perfectly. There's no diversion to the legal market. It, today, now, opium also, technology improved a lot, is extracted directly from the plant, and so on. So, the system works. Why transform drug cultivation in Afghanistan in a supply of unnecessary drugs to bodies that do not require them? First. Second, how do you control that? How do you control that? A production of uh, a, a couple of hundred thousand hectares, scattered, as I told you, scattered in little pieces, controlling it, will cost uh, uh, ten times the production of opium poppy. So, is, this is an idea that floated for a while because some prominent uh, intellectuals uh, advanced a couple of years ago, then it died other wrong ideas to buy, to buy the product to, from the peasants. The Americans tried to do it in Southeast Asia 30 years ago. This is simply to encourage cultivation. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if, you want, <laughs> if you pay the peasant to cultivate, the following year there will be two peasants to <laughs> cultivate. Because of, uh, they start with the, from the evaluation, it is very cheap to buy opium cultivation at the source. The original idea is not wrong. It's so cheap 
that instead of uh, paying billions of dollars against the organized crime, against paying and treating the addicts in the countries of uh, destination, is of course 300, 200 million dollars at the source, and you pa, finish it. It's not so, it never worked. Never worked and never was seriously applied because it is not possible to apply. I mean, it, today for me it is possible with a very modest uh, investment, uh, but uh, avoiding mistakes of the past. Uh, we learned a lot, but because sometimes we supported uh, wrong ideas, like also to, to fund the peasants. Uh, um, not controlling the diversion to legal crops. Um, there have been many errors. Uh, and now we develop this idea of the inter integral development. We are not obliged to do crop, crop substitution. So you have a good uh, industry that can transform uh, other uh, materials. Why don't? Why don't? Afghanistan, for instance, plenty of of opportunities in, the, in this area. If there is an area where there is a mineral, why insist on funding uh, uh, alternative development crops? Why crops? You can, you can also have uh, many other uh, alternatives to crop substitution. Talk with the Taliban, treating them as winners as they are. They are winners. When you will, ah yes, if they, if they have to come here and then, then uh, no, no, it's not that way. You cannot treat them as losers. They won. An independence war against the biggest army in the world. With nothing in their hands. And they know that. They have to be treated as winner, as winner, then and with humility and with respect. First, first thing, which is, in my opinion, the most important of all. If you treat them with the respect they deserve, you will get from them whatever is necessary to get, starting with women. But if we treat them as primitive, as sauvage, that just are there because who knows why. As bloodthirsty uh, uh, primitive people, you get nothing from them. They immediately close and say who, who you are, who you are, to tell us how to treat our women, how to treat uh, our country, who you are. This is the reaction you get. This is the most important thing to deal with the Taliban. They won, and they are legitimate winner. So start to treat them this way. Why you have to tell them how they should do their government? The government should be inclusive. <laughs> what does it mean, inclusive? What does it mean, inclusive? I mean, you should establish the, how many Azaras, how many uh, um, Tajik, and minorities should be in the government. I mean, this is difficult to do even in the, in the West. If you should start to really respect all ethnic composition of countries, you, you, it's very difficult. No, the Taliban should do it since the, since the beginning. I mean, that's irritate them a lot. They will, because they won also with the cooperation of Menotad Pastun. There are also many. Azay, Azaras and others who are in the coalition, the Taliban, Azaras, uh, uh, Azeris, and so on. But it's up to them. It is an internal issue that you cannot establish from outside. How, how much inclusive should be a new government? I mean, I mean, when we won the Second World War, <laughs> we had big problems in establishing governments all over Europe. And the Taliban showed a degree of responsibility that is absolutely admirable. They did not do vengeance killings all over Afghanistan. 
which I see, I expected to see. After the Second World War, Nazi collaborators, fascist collaborators in Europe got, got killed 10, 15 years after the war. In Italy, we had uh, an extension of vengeance killings related to the war that, that ended up in the 50s. I mean, uh, hundreds of killings. For, for, I mean, th things are also very complicated in the war. There are innocent people also killed uh, and so on. But, uh, but the minimum accusation that you were a collaborator of Nazis, of a fascist, condemned you to death. And we, we still have cases. After 70 years, we still about it. So a civil war with that ferocity has, 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 has uh, consequences that can last very long. They, they did an amnesty. They did not did vengeance with, against anybody. They did not uh, punish state uh, employees who were working with the former government. There was no blood around. And they did the amnesty for all of them. So, I mean, these are things that show a degree of responsibility. Then I told you, they are not normal people. I mean, they are radic radicals, extremists, with a very strange mentality uh, that you have to understand and respect. Then, if you... But they are also flexible. They are not stupid at all. They are flexible. If you put on the table the right thing with the right attitude, this is the first thing, right attitude, you can get from them whatever you think it is necessary. Starting with the issue of women. They were always very, very flexible. Then newspaper, you see uh, that, uh, that girl or that school in that part of Afghanistan is close to women and so on. This is, this is not fair. They always had the problem to control also their movement and also their country. When I was there, we had uh, almost every day problem with uh, Taliban uh, extremists, uh, uh, crazy, that were destroying uh, um, TV set uh, and so on. But, uh, but well, this was not absolutely a widespread phenomenon. There were phenomena of intolerance, of women oppression and so on, but you cannot really generalize and from one or two or cases make a big, a big fuss. Uh, you have to measure the situation on the ground with a different attitude and you will, you will get the results. They are, their main interest is to survive and to govern the country that has no state structure, they have no money, they have no tax collecting, they, have no, they don't know how to collect taxes, they don't know, it's their main problem, the, emerg the humanitarian emergency and so on. So, in my opinion, if you go with them, with, with talking to them as human beings, as, and also winner of a long war, and respect them, I mean, you can get from them what is necessary. They, why? They should be crazy to do not accept a proposal, a serious proposal. But no one does it. No one, EU started the, in a good way, Borrell and the others saying that we have to, we have to talk to them and so on. They, then they stopped. You have to talk to them, but with the proposal in mind, with the right attitude, treating them as they deserve, and you will get what you want from them. They are not against the... Uh, I mean, they were a few Americans until the, they, were, they are the heirs of Mujahideen. They, they are not communist. They are not. They are nothing. They are just uh, nationalist, uh, religious people. In a Muslim way, I mean, with a degree of also internal uh, tolerance and contradiction, like us Catholics and so on. That uh, is remarkable. It's remarkable, and uh, go and do this. But, uh, I mean, uh, public opinion in my country was paralyzed for three months, talking or not talking with the Taliban, which is the most stupid thing. <laughs> you must talk with them. So Sorry. I think, uh, the, Sorry. The, the, the idea of doing politics through military means has clearly failed. So that means that diplomacy has to take over, and the key idea of diplomacy has always been to put yourself in the place of the other. 
see things from the way they see yeah. it. Try to see what And if you do that and you simply talk together, history has shown there's hardly anything that cannot be solved. But it also means that exactly doing this is not something that's in a certain sense decided on the ground in Afghanistan. This is especially the question of shifting this paradigm, this way of thinking in the Western world. In countries like this country, like here, like Denmark, which has been part of the problem for quite some time, despite its tradition, suddenly jumped into this, yes, we'll do this militaristic foreign policy and we're doing humanity a great, a great favor. That has been totally disproven. Now the question is exactly having this shift in the Western world and saying, that failed, now, uh, let's be responsible, let's do the other thing. And I think this call that Helga said, was it on Thursday, we had this day of action, is exactly this. How do you show that you now will respect Taliban as a country? Not, not as subjects, not as some uh, subjects you can tell what to do, but say, okay, you have your country, you run your country, we collaborate with you. The first thing is, of course, to, to, to recognize it as a country Absolutely. and give them the, the right to, to, to actually deal with their, with, 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 with their deposits and whatever, and then say, I think, I mean, even a country like Denmark, I mean, you know, the problem is water, the problem is food, you know, is there something we can do to help these things? Of course, there's an enormous amount. Europe has enormous skills. The U.S. Army, of course, has enormous skills, but I don't know if that's the best thing to yeah. throw into it. But so can these no, problems be solved? Recognizing the sure. government, first of all, recognition. So I mean, they won, they control the country. But Europe uh, recognized a, a person in Venezuela, Mr. Guaido, who had not the support even of his wife, <laughs> recognized by 50 countries, like this, <laughs> a person who does not control nothing. Uh, I mean, we should be even more coherent and serious in what we do in foreign policy. Respecting basic rules, who control territory population must be recognized, period. So, we are coming to a close. So, uh... I want to thank the speakers again for coming here and enlightening us. And I think it's a very, as I said, time is of the essence here. It's very important to move very fast on these things. So it's very important to move the discussion in whichever way is possible. So thanks for coming. And also the rest of you very much thanks for coming. And, and make sure the discussion moves as ring in the waters from here. And, and, uh...